Hi, everyone. Welcome to the channel. My name is Nick Cosgrove, and I am back with this week's No Filter Q&A. This is the episode where I answer all questions related to diet, training, and supplementation that I've received over the last seven days from our in-house clients, online clients, as well as a few of our online followers. Remember, if you have any questions related to your nutritional plan, workout program, supplements you're taking, not taking, considering taking, please feel free to email me those questions at nick at foreverfitperformance.com, or you can DM me your questions on my Instagram at fitcosgrove underscore. All right, let's get started with this week's no filter Q&A with question number one. Nick, approximately how many calories does a 60 minute resistance training workout burn? Good question. Um, this will depend on a few factors. One will be is how intense you're training, right? Are you someone who's taking 30 to 45 seconds in between sets? Are you someone who's taking one minute plus, two minutes up to five minutes, sitting on a bench, sitting on a piece of exercise equipment, cruising Instagram, going through TikTok reels, right? So it really depends on how intense you're training, okay? Because if you're not training intense, basically all you're doing is just sitting around in the gym, right? You might get your heart rate up a little bit during your sets, but if you're not continuously keeping that heart rate up, you're not going to be burning as many calories, okay? So that's going to be the first factor. Second is going to be your genetics. Some people are just, uh, you know, genetically prone to burn more calories than other people, right? This will depend on how fast your metabolism is. Some people burn more calories in a rested state versus others. So that's going to come into consideration as well. People who generally carry more muscle will burn more calories in a rested state. And therefore, when they're exercising, they'll also burn more calories, right? Whereas someone who is overweight, though, they have to exert a lot of force, a lot of energy just to move. So they will burn calories, right? But the person who has more muscle will burn more calories for a longer period of time. Now, that gets me into my third factor. So with weightlifting, you can't look at how many calories you're going to burn in that 60 minute weight training session. What you should be looking at is how many calories are you going to burn for the remainder of the day? Because if you're someone who lifts weights regularly, that means that you're going to have a large amount of muscle mass on your frame. The more muscle you have, I've said this time and time again, the more muscle you have, the more calories you burn in a rested state. But because you've done a weight training, let's say you do a weight training session at 9 a.m. in the morning, your metabolism is revving up the rest of the day. So you're actually burning more calories throughout the day. Okay. In addition to the fact that you have muscles, so you're burning additional calories because you have more muscles, so you're burning more calories in a rested state. When you're back at home working on a computer, when you're uh, just like walking around doing groceries, or even when you're going to bed at night. Okay. So that's where the benefits of weight training really come in. And I've said this before, I truly believe that you'll burn more calories long-term with resistance training over just cardiovascular activity. Okay. Everyone always looks to do cardio when it comes to fat loss, but what you really should be looking at is weight training. Okay. And it's funny because weight training is something that is, it's like two in one, you're going to work the cardiovascular system and you're going to work your muscular system. I'm not saying don't do cardio. Cardio is great, but don't rely on cardio for fat loss. So to answer that question, it's really difficult to give you an approximate number. I know people have Apple watches and, you know, they'll, they'll plug in how much they weigh and they'll get their heart rate up and, Listen, I really don't think they're that accurate, but judging from a lot of my clients who do wear Apple watches during our workouts, uh, they'll burn anywhere from 300 to 700 calories in 60 minutes. And the reason why it's such a wide range, again, it depends on the individual, it depends on how much somebody weighs, right? I have people that when they work legs with me, their heart rate gets really high. So according to their Apple watch, they're burning even more calories, right? Because they're exerting more force. Do I necessarily believe that's true? Maybe to some extent, but I wouldn't say it's an exact truth as to you're burning exactly 504 calories for a workout. I wouldn't say that, no. So that's the range that most people fall within who have Apple Watches. But again, I wouldn't worry about how, are you, how many calories you're burning in that initial session. It's gonna be that what you're gonna be burning for the remainder of the day if you are doing your weights on a regular basis. Uh, next question. Uh, Nick, would swimming be good for weight loss? I don't think I can run anymore and hate using the bike. Swimming is an excellent cardiovascular exercise for weight loss. I, and I strongly advise clients to do it, especially people who struggle with knee pain. Let's say they have patellofemoral syndrome or they have plantar fasciitis or if they're overweight. You know, it's very difficult for someone who carries a lot of weight to never mind go for a run, but even go for a long walk. Right. So the great thing about swimming, it's non weight bearing. It's great on the joints and it offers you a bit of resistance as well. So if you can get in the pool, you know, you do like say 30 minutes of laps and you do that three to four times a week, you will notice a significant change in your physique, 
I've seen it with clients who get in the pool. Okay. But you got to be moving and you have to be consistent. Okay. You can't just be doing it once a week. That's why I tell people you should be doing it three to four. If you can even five days a week, Monday to Friday, take the weekends off. Um, but yeah, I think swimming is an excellent form of cardiovascular exercise. I, in fact, I actually think swimming is probably the best form of cardiovascular activity that you can do for weight loss. Okay. Um, a second, I would put up using the elliptical trainer because what I like about the elliptical trainer, if you're working in a commercial gym or if you have an elliptical trainer at home, that again is non-weight bearing and it's really good on the hip, especially the hip abductors. So as people get older, they find they have a lot of issues with their hips, especially people who put on weight. The elliptical trainer is great for that because it helps keep you mobile, right? So it provides a little bit of mobility and flexibility in those hip abductors and hip flexors. But I really believe that swimming is one of the best forms of cardiovascular activity you can do. Um, I'm not a big fan of running uh, for the reasons I mentioned, especially if you're someone like myself who's 220 pounds, me running, that puts a lot of pressure on my knees. So I wouldn't really get much benefit out of running at this point in my life. So swimming though, I can do. And swimming feels good on my joints, right? So it's a great activity to throw in. Um, if you have access to a pool, I would definitely recommend trying to do it three to four times a week. Um, and not even if you're trying to lose weight, it's just good for your overall heart, right? Because as I mentioned before, you shouldn't rely on cardiovascular activity to burn fat, but cardiovascular activity is excellent for your heart. So I do believe everyone should be doing some form of cardiovascular activity at least three to four times a week. And swimming would be a great activity to add into your daily uh, workout regimen in addition to resistance training. All right, uh, next question. Nick, I can't stop eating. The more I eat, the more hungrier I become. I put on easily 30 pounds since December and feel depressed. Is there anything I can do or take to stop myself from this mindless binging? You know, this is another common issue, and it's really hard for me to answer this question without looking over your current nutritional plan. Um, what I typically see, though, with people who have problems with overeating and not practicing proper portion control is that they tend to eat too many carbs and not enough fats. Okay, You have to remember that fats will allow you to stay fuller for a longer period of time. And I mentioned this on uh, the Q&A last week is if you want to lose fat, you have to consume more fats. Okay, so I'm not saying carbs are bad. Okay, I'll never tell you carbs are bad, but simple carbs are not what we want because what simple carbs do is they spike your blood sugar levels. Once your blood sugar levels are spiked, guess what happens? Your insulin levels start to drop. Then guess what happens? You start to crave more carbs. You start to crave sugar. So then you tend to overeat, you tend to binge, right? So this is why I always tell people is don't do these low carb diets unless you're incredibly sensitive to carbs, just stick with complex carbohydrates. What I mentioned in the past, Oatmeal, yams, sweet potatoes, quinoa, brown rice, you know, these are excellent sources of carbohydrates that you can add in. But in addition to these carbs, you're going to need to have some healthy fats. And as I mentioned last week, natural peanut butter, omega-3 eggs, salmon, right? Um, extra virgin olive oil, almonds, avocado. These are all good, healthy fats. Fats will keep you fuller for a longer period of time, so it'll stop you from overeating. Okay. So whenever I'm working with someone who has a hard time practicing portion control, I'll typically start them on a fairly high fat, moderate carb and high protein diet. And it takes a few weeks, but it does help curb those cravings. Okay. Um, another thing too, is make sure you're hydrated. I can't stress this enough. You should, this is, I tell everyone, if, if you're, let's say 130 pound female, you should be getting in at least, and this is my personal opinion, at least a minimum of two to three liters of water per day. If you're a 200 plus pound male, you should be getting in at least four liters of water per day. Okay. When you're getting in all that water, trust me, you're not going to want to be constantly eating. So whenever I feel that I'm, I, you know, I'm, I'm craving food, I, I like ask myself, okay, I'm actually hungry or my, is my blood sugar levels low? Would I do better by just having a tablespoon of peanut butter and maybe like, you know, two or three glasses of water? Usually that works. Um, I had the fats in my body and then I am hydrated and I feel fine. I don't have any more cravings. But if I go and I start eating more, let's say white rice, white potatoes, or even if I start having more complex carbs, or I just start eating more brown rice, if you eat too much, it's going to spike those blood sugar levels. So you have to be very careful of carbohydrates. Okay. And that's why I recommend uh, to anyone who's trying to lose weight, when you're figuring out how much carbs you should have in a diet, I would typically times it by 0 0.5 to 1 per uh, gram per pound of body weight, right? So if you weigh 200 pounds, you should be looking at anywhere from 100 to 200 grams of carbs per day, depending on what your weight loss goals are, okay? And that will work. And with fats, I always recommend people use that uh, 
that formula of 0 0.75 times your body weight, okay, per grams. And that should give you the amount of grams that you should be having roughly per day, okay? Um, but I, I, I really truly believe unless you have um, an eating disorder, and that, that very well could be too, and that could be something you might want to talk to someone about, um, but if it's not an eating disorder and you're just finding that you're just like constantly hungry and you're just eating mindlessly, chances are your fats are too low and you're not hydrated. So get those things in order first and then see how you are with portion control and mindless snacking. If it continues and you're continuing to binge, it might be a good idea to go talk to somebody, okay? Um, a psychologist, um, someone that can help you with that. Maybe it's just something that's more internal, right? Okay. Okay. All right. Uh, next question. Okay. So this was actually sent to me last week um, following up my uh, Q&A. Someone wrote it in the comments. So... Uh, the person that said to me, you mentioned that ribeye is unhealthy because of saturated fats. Uh, could you please provide more science-based arguments on this? Steak is a hundred times better than oats, rice, and whatever the fitness industry believes in. All right. So let's just go for a little fact check first. Um, I never said that ribeye is unhealthy because of the saturated fats. So I want to be clear on that. Okay. I've always told people when you're putting together a nutritional plan that you need to monitor your saturated fats. I've never said saturated fats are actually bad. I've just said that you want to have them sparingly, right? I've always said trans fats are bad. There's a difference here. Now, polysaturated fats are excellent for you. Those are the good fats. But when it comes to saturated fats, too much saturated fats can lead to problems. Heart disease, stroke, you have to be careful with this, okay? Can lead to clogged arteries. So I'm not saying that the ribeye is bad because of the saturated fats. Now. So let's get that clear first. Um, I'm not a big advocate of using too much saturated fats in a diet. However, I do believe that we do need some saturated fats in your diet. Okay. Uh, and in my opinion, we get enough saturated fats from a lot of good foods. Okay. So we don't need to add it in through the bad foods, which brings me to the ribeye. The reason I don't like people having ribeyes or my clients having ribeyes, you're not my client, do whatever the hell you want. But I don't put ribeyes on people's plans is because red meat in general is very hard for the body to digest. Okay. We know this. It can create all kinds of problems with digestive tract and lead to polyps. There's, there's issues with red meat in general. Okay. So whenever I do put red meat on someone's plan, I always ask them to have a very lean cut of meat. Okay. So if it's extra lean ground beef, flank steak, iron steak, very lean. Okay, so it's not because of the saturated fat in the ribeye, it's just the amount of fat that's in ribeye. Too much fat is not good either. And we don't want to get too much fat A in one sitting and also too much fatty, uh, too much fat from animal sources like beef. Okay, it's not the same from getting it from salmon, which is omega-3 fats. Those are good, really good fats for you. So that was my, my issue with the ribeye. Okay, it had nothing to do with the saturated fats. So I want to be clear on that because I think a lot of people think I'm, well, this person did anyway, thinks that I'm against all fats and I'm, I'm absolutely not. The only fats I really don't recommend people take in are trans fats because in my opinion, trans fats, there's no reason to have them in a the diet. They offer no benefits whatsoever. And you can find trans fats in like most pastries, right? Muffins, donuts, fried foods. There's a lot of trans fats. Okay, so we don't want those fats in a diet. But saturated fats, yeah, we need a little bit of saturated fats. But in my opinion, if you're following a good, clean, wholesome diet, you're going to get enough saturated fats from the good food sources. Because as I mentioned, saturated fat is needed, but we just don't need too much of it. Okay. Again, when this person sent me this comment, I, I sent them a link from a Harvard study explaining that, you know, if you take in an abundant amount of saturated fat, that can lead to heart disease. Okay. So... To answer your, uh, what your comment, it wasn't a question, but your comment about uh, steak being more healthy than oats and rice, uh, I would disagree with you on that, okay? I mean, you're comparing a fatty protein source to a complex carbohydrate source. So if you're going to compare one food source to the other, my recommendation is compare a carb to a carb, right? Compare a protein to a protein, compare fat to a fat. So you're comparing apples and oranges here. Um, oats are good for you, Okay. Uh, rice, people are going to go on about the arsenic again, but I've mentioned this time and time again, you have to be consuming huge amounts of brown rice daily. And I'm talking like 10 plus cups a day for years on end for that arsenic to have any negative effects on you whatsoever. Okay. And again, if you're worried about the arsenic in rice, if this is what you are concerned about, rinse your rice. Okay. So if you're worried about the oats, buy organic oats. <laughs> 
<laughs> Oat, oats and rice are not bad foods. And steak, I never said steak's a bad food either. But there are certain cuts that I would stay away from, ribeye being one of them. All right. Next question. Uh, Nick, I'm curious as to why you don't count calories. I heard you mention it a few weeks ago on a Q&A. Could you please elaborate on this? Thanks, Nick. Yeah, uh, good question. Um, so if you work with me on my online coaching app, you'll notice that calories are counted for, um, but I actually never pay attention to them. And the reason why is because calorie counting to me is irrelevant when your goal is to build muscle and lose fat, okay? What you're trying to look at more than just the calories are A, the macronutrients, and B, the micronutrients, okay? The quality of the foods you are consuming. If all you're doing is calorie counting, yeah, you'll lose weight. If you go into a caloric deficit, let's say you go on a nutritional plan, a very generic nutritional plan designed from one of these um, you know, online apps, not mine, but something that's just for, designed for the masses that you just plug in your weights uh, and says, okay, you need to consume 1300 calories per day to lose weight. You'll lose weight. I mean, you, you'll definitely lose weight. You'll probably lose two to three pounds a week, maybe even more if you throw in some cardiovascular activity on top of that and weight training. But the weight you're going to lose is going to be predominantly water and muscle. Okay. And I mentioned this before is that our bodies are very smart. They're very resilient. So your body will, your bodies will always hold on to fat and water be, um, before it burns muscle, right? So, so let me rephrase that. Your body will always burn muscle before you lose fat, before you lose water. So if you go into a caloric deficit, the first thing that you're going to start, your body's going to start burning is muscle. Okay. So yes, you will lose fat, but you're also going to lose muscle and you're going to lose water weight. So that's why I don't, do not recommend counting calories. Uh, but as I mentioned, I do recommend counting macronutrients and paying attention to the micronutrients, the quality of the foods that you are consuming. Okay. So that's why I don't count calories. If you want to just lose weight in general, you want to go from say 130 pounds down to 120 pounds in six to eight weeks, by all means, calorie count, it'll work, but you're not going to lose 10 pounds of fat. You might lose three or four pounds of fat, but the, the majority of that weight loss is going to be muscle and water, okay? So again, that's why I don't count calories. Um, if you work with me on my online coaching app, the calories are automatically calculated. But again, I, I don't look at a single, I never look up at the calorie counter. I'm gonna go, oh, you're having 3,000 calories this week, or you're having 2,500 calories. I don't look, I don't care. I look at the macronutrients and I look at the micronutrients. Okay. Uh, next question. Uh, Nick, do you train and make diet plans for friends and family? And if so, do you find it more challenging to work with people who are closer to you? Um, you know what? I, I don't train friends or family members and I don't customize nutritional plans for friends or family members either. Um, if ever I have a friend or family member who reaches out to me and wants some help with their diet or their training program, I refer out. Um, I refer to other trainers in the industry. Okay. Um, I don't feel that as a professional in this industry, it's, it, I feel as a professional in this industry, I should say, it's very difficult to train people who are in your inner circle because, you know, they, they, they know you too well and they might not take your advice as seriously as opposed to someone who they are paying a regular rate for, right? Paying for their services. So, I've never done it. Um, I mean, I shouldn't say I never done it. I think I did it when I first started training uh, clients back in the day. Um, but I quickly found out, you know, working with friends, I'd have people cancel on me last minute. It'd be hard to enforce my 24-hour cancellation policy. I'd design nutritional plans for family members. They wouldn't follow through. And then I'd feel like I'm chasing them down when I'm like, I don't really want to come down hard on them because they're a family member. So I just tell you, you know what, if ever I have a friend or family member that reaches out to me for nutritional advice or training programs or wants to work out with me in person, I always refer outwards um, just for those reasons. Um, I, it's just, you know, I like to work with people who are seeking to work with me and will do exactly what I say. I mean, yes, we can always, you know, modify the program as we go and find some common ground um, and compromise on certain things. But at the end of the day, if you're working with me, you're going to follow my training program and my nutritional plan. Obviously, I'll make modifications along the way when necessary. Right. And then, like I said, I will compromise with people. You know, I have some people who I'm not a big fan of dairy, but I'll put it on their plan because I know they love dairy. I'm not a big fan of fruit, but I know they love fruit. So I'll put fruit on their plan. So I make compromises with people along the way. But for the majority of the plan, nutritional plan and our training program, 
it's my way or no way. And the reason why is because I don't want to waste someone's time. I want to give them results. I want to help them achieve those results. So for them to achieve those results, they have to follow the program that I'm laying out for them or else why work with me? <laughs> why work with someone if you're going to second guess everything they give you, right? So that's why I don't work with friends and family members. It's too close to my inner circle. Um, but like I said, I, I always refer out. I've had friends reach out to me and I have, I know tons of great trainers in this industry and I'm happy to always refer them out to any of my friends or family members that want to start taking a step towards their health and fitness and improve their quality of life. Okay. Uh, Nick, I have big legs, but they are not cut enough. I squat over 400 pounds for six to eight reps and leg press close to a thousand pounds. Do I need to diet harder or increase the reps that I'm doing in the gym? Um, you know, I would say both. And on top of that, I would add in drop sets. So let's go for the diet first. Typically, if you're trying to get a little bit more leaner, you have to really monitor your nutritional plan, right? You have to make sure you're getting lots of lean protein, um, good healthy fats, and moderate carbohydrates. The amount will depend on your body type. Are you an endomorph? Are you an ectomorph? Are you a mesomorph? Are you a combination of two, right? So once you know that, then you can, you know, customize a program designed specifically for you. If you're someone like me, you can eat like 5,000, 6,000 calories a day and not put on a pound. If I want to put on weight, I really have to eat, right? Whereas I have other people I work with, if I want them to build muscle, I could put them on 1,500 to 2,000 calories a day and they'll put on muscle because their metabolism is slower. So it really depends on your metabolism. So that would be one is your diet, right? You want to make sure that's in check. Um, number two would be your rep ranges. I'm not a big fan of single digit reps. I know I've said that before, but this is the exact reason I'm not a big fan of them is that they create kind of like that bulky, thick muscle because you are lifting very heavy weight, but for very short reps, right? A uh, very short rep range, I should say. So my recommendation is to stay within that 10 to 15 rep range, okay? That to me creates more solid, lean, dense muscle. And finally, drop sets. Drop sets are crucial. One of the reasons I've always been able to maintain a fairly lean physique, it has nothing to do with the amount of cardio I do or even the diet plan I follow. A lot of it has to do with the way I train in the gym. Um, and I'm a firm believer of throwing drop sets in on almost every single exercise you do. So if you're doing like barbell back squats, and I've done this for years, let's say you're doing your last set, uh, and let's say you're squatting 315, right? I'll use this as an example. So you're squatting 315, that's three plates a side. You do 10 reps, immediately out of the squat rack, take off a plate per side, now you're squatting two plates per side, get back in the squat rack, 10 more reps, immediately out of the squat rack, take another uh, 45 off each side, right back in, do 10 more reps. You've just done 30 reps in less than 90 seconds. That's gonna get your heart rate up, but it's also going to really, really burn out those muscle fibers. And it's going to really just bring out more definition, right? More quality, lean, dense muscle. That's what does it. You have to get those muscle fibers to pop. Okay. And in my opinion, drop sets are an excellent way to do that. So yeah, I would, I would tweak your diet. You'd have to really examine your diet, you know, work with maybe a trainer that can help you customize a program specifically for you and your body type. Um, Keep your reps in double digits, so no, no more of these single digits. Even that means you have to drop your weight. Maybe you're not going to be squatting 400 pounds or leg pressing 1,000 pounds. That's fine. Don't worry about the weight. Okay, You can build great legs off lighter weights. I've developed great legs over the years. I've never squatted more than 315 in my life. Okay, So you don't need to necessarily lift heavier weights to get better results. That's a misconception. Okay, Perfect form, perfect technique, full range of motion. That's what creates results. It's not about how heavy you lift in the gym, okay? Because I see a lot of people lifting heavy in the gym, but they're not using full range of motion and they're not using good form or technique. And you're not going to create any quality lean muscle. All you're going to create is an injury, okay? So yeah, custom, tweak your diet a little bit, increase your reps, throw in some drop sets. Hell, I throw in drop sets on all your uh, all your leg exercises if you're having this problem. Triple drop sets too, you know? And that, that's a great way to make those legs really pop. Uh, next question. Nick, is it better to work out in the morning or at night? Which is better for fat loss and muscle gain? I've had this question come in a few times. So the time of day you train is irrelevant. Okay. It, it's what works for you and your body clock. So if you're someone like me who gets up at 5 a.m. every day, you're probably going to train better earlier in the day, right? As opposed to at the end of the day when you're tired. I noticed for myself personally, if I train at, let's say, one o'clock in the afternoon, my workouts are much better as opposed to if I train at eight o'clock at night. 
you know, because I've, I've been up by the time eight o'clock comes around, I've already been up for well over 12 hours and my body's starting to get tired. My body clock is tired. So I know the workouts are not as good, right? And a late workout will affect my quality of sleep. And if my quality of sleep is affected and I have to wake up early, obviously my sleep is going to be off and that's going to have an effect, impact on my energy levels throughout the day. And it's going to affect my workout. So for me, generally morning to early afternoon works best. But if you're someone who is more of a night person, you know, let's say that you work nights and you get home from work at 12 or one o'clock in the morning, if you're in the restaurant industry, and then you wake up at 10 or 11 in the morning, you might find that you train better towards the later part of the afternoon, five o'clock, six o'clock before you head into work. So it really depends on your body clock and your lifestyle. Um, as far as muscle gaining and weight loss goes, but work, working out morning or night, it doesn't matter. It's whenever works best for you, because whenever works best for you is going to give you the best results because you're going to work out with the utmost amount of intensity. Okay. So I have a lot of people, I shouldn't say a lot of people, but I have a few people who I train who work in the restaurant industry. They work in the evenings. So for them doing fasted cardio first thing in the morning, well, they can still do it. But first thing in the morning for them is going to be like 1130 in the morning. And then they'll go to their weights later on in the afternoon. That's fine. They still get the same results as someone who gets up at 5 a.m. and does their cardio at 530 in the morning. It just depends on your body clock, okay? Um, so you have to find the time that works best for you. The one thing I would recommend, though, is try to get your, your workouts on a fairly consistent schedule. Um, I struggled with that for the first few years when I started my business because I kind of just worked out whenever I didn't have a client or I never didn't have a meeting or I didn't have to do an online uh, meeting or, or do an online program with a client. So I would just base my workout around that. And, you know, that was very difficult because sometimes my workouts would be at 5 a.m. and other times they'd be at 9 p.m. And then sometimes they'd be at 2 p.m. So they were all over the place. Um, now, after being in business for 20 years, I've been able to give myself more of a consistent workout schedule. And my body likes that more because my body knows how many meals it's going to have before it works out, how many meals it's going to have after it works out, how far I am away from waking up versus how long I'm away from going to sleep when I'm putting in that workout. So the body does like consistency. So that's my only recommendation. If you have the luxury of training at the same time or close to the same time every day, that's better for your body. But at the end of the day, if you can't do that, just try to get your workout in when you can. Okay, but you have to do it when it works best for you, your body clock and your body. Okay. All right. Uh, two more questions. Uh, Nick, I would really like to train with you, but unfortunately it's not in my budget right now. Do you offer less expensive options for clients who would like to work with you? Uh, yeah, we have a, quite a few options, um, you know, more cost effective, more cost effective options for people who want to work with either myself or one of the trainers. Absolutely. Working with a coach privately in person is obviously going to be the most expensive option, right? Because you're working with someone who can customize a program for you in person, right? Um, but there are more cost effective options. Partner training is one of them. So if you have a friend or family member that you want to train with, a coworker, we do partner training sessions all the time. We've even matched up clients who want to work together, right? Or who are looking for someone to split the cost of a training session with them. We do that all the time. Um, another thing is small group classes. You know, we have, I believe, at our downtown location, 24 small group classes. At our location in Burnaby, I believe we have 18 group classes right now. So another option is joining a small group class. Um, obviously, in a small group class, you're not going to get the same attention as uh, you would in a one-on-one -on -one private training session. You're not going to get that same customized approach, but it is a lot more cost effective, right? Um, and finally, online training. Uh, you know, a lot of people are not, there's a lot of people out there that still don't understand the benefits of online training. And it's not just me giving you a program and saying, off you go. I'm holding you accountable to follow that program. Right. You're doing weekly check ins with me, bi weekly check ins with me if you're working with me on your nutritional plan. Right. And you also have me as your coach all day, every day. So you can send me a question and I'll get back to you within at least six hours. I always get back to clients within six hours. Okay. So, it, you know, the great thing with online training is you are working with someone who's customizing a program for you specifically and will hold you accountable for those workouts. With my online coaching app, you have to, once you're done your workout, you have to record your workout. So I get to see that you did your workout. Um, I get to make sure that you're following your nutritional plan. You're sending me photos, progress updates. Uh, we're going back and forth and where we need to tweak the training program, where we make changes and revisions in the nutritional plan. So it's like having me in your corner, just not in person. And that's another cost-effective option as well. Okay, so 
we do have quite a few options available from the partner training to the small group training to the online training. Okay? And as I said, I'm always, always open to working with new clients. Uh, my in-house roster does fill up quite quickly. So I do offer some after hours, which are, um, when I believe right now for the month of April, they're Wednesdays and Thursdays from, I believe they're from 2 p.m. to 5 p.m. So I have some after hour sessions, time slots that are available at our downtown location. Okay. So if you'd like more information on that, you can always uh, email me at nick at foreverfitperformance.com or you can DM me on my Instagram, fitcosio underscore, and I'll give you more information on any and all of the services that we provide. All right. Uh, last question. Uh, nick, if a man was trying to put on a lot of muscle in a short period of time, would it be better to abstain from sex for a period of time so as not to lose any testosterone? <laughs> Uh, okay. I, I've had this question actually, you know, it, it's, it's funny because I've had this question quite a bit over the years. Um, and I don't know if it's come from like the old Rocky movies or I don't know, the old boxing stories of guys wanting to abstain from sex before a big fight or before a big match. And listen, no, you're not going to lose testosterone from having sex. If anything, you're actually going to create more testosterone from having sex. So you should be having more sex. Okay. Um, sex is good for us sex is healthy right um as long as it's done with a consenting partner it, it it's good it's it's fine it's it's actually not only is it good for your physical health but it's great for your mental health right it allows you to think more clearly right so you're not going to lose any testosterone from having sex i promise you that's not going to happen i think i i don't really know where that came from it, it must be some kind of because i've had it a few times over the years from guys and there's no science backing that whatsoever. Okay. Um, and as I said, you know, I always, I'm a true believer that the more sex you have, uh, the higher your testosterone is going to be. Right. Um, cause again, sex is, is good for us, not, not just physically, but mentally. And it's really good for our, our hormones, right? It's really good. It helps replenish our testosterone in my opinion. Okay. Now I don't have any science backing that, but that's just, how I personally feel. And that's how other guys who I've worked with over the years feel too. They, they feel better coming in the gym. They feel more refreshed. They feel energized, better mood. So there's so many benefits to having sex on a regular basis, as opposed to just abstaining from it. Now, if you're abstaining it for, for religious reasons or personal reasons, all the power to you. But if you're doing it because you want to um, <laughs> conserve and preserve your, your testosterone, no, you, it doesn't happen like that okay so i promise you there's there's no there's no scientific data that i've ever seen that backs that claim if you've seen this bring it to my attention email it to me you know email me some uh, studies some some research on this but i have never seen any link between low testosterone and too much sex okay so have sex have lots of sex just make sure you're having sex with a consenting partner um consensual sex is better <laughs> But either in that, no, no reason to abstain from sex because you're worried about losing testosterone. Anyway, that's it for this week's No Filter Q&A. This episode will be going up on Monday, April the 1st. As a reminder, if you do have any questions with regards to your nutritional plan, workout program, supplements you are taking, not taking, considering taking, please feel free to email me those questions at nick at foreverfitperformance.com or DM me your questions on my Instagram at fitcosgrove underscore. Thank you all for watching today's episode. Thank you all for supporting my in-house business. Thank you for supporting my online coaching app. And I will see you all next week. Bye for now.